Your main character's life is at stake. Four other characters live or die depending on the choices your main character makes. An entire room of onlookers watch, and the scene is empty of everything except for the five primary characters. The silence is palpable, and yet, for those of us watching or reading your story from the comfort of the couch, the scene is more boring than my nephew's dance recital. Why? How do we fix this? And how do we make a scene from scratch so that even something as mundane as sitting in a room becomes hair-raisingly intense? Today we're going to go over two ways to add suspense to a scene that is already written, then take one step further by looking at one way to write a suspenseful scene from scratch, and finally we're going to put it all together into storytelling so that your audience doesn't pass out from exhaustion while watching your story. Suspense is a lot like diarrhea, you know it's there, but you're not exactly sure when it's going to become a problem. When telling a story, this issue of knowing and who knows what modifies how the situation is received by the audience. Is the suspense interpreted as funny, ironic, or horrific? Lucky for you guys, we're going to have the chance to look at all three, because we're using Late Night with the Devil for our example. First things first, horror is not my diarrhea of choice, but that's typically because it's lazily done with jump scares and Jamie Lee Curtis, who I just can't help but associate with Activia. Horror is not just an unstoppable force with a hatchet popping out from the shower to cut your butt off. It's the extreme side of suspense where the repercussions of a character's actions are death and pain. So, essentially eating at Taco Bell. That said, if you can get me to grip the toilet bowl for my life because I'm actually terrified for your characters, kudos, because you've mastered the art form, and that leads us into point number one, and I'm sorry to say this, but people still mess this up. I need to care that your characters don't die. I know, I say it all the time, but that is always the most important part of a story, and probably more so for horror because the more you make an audience identify with your hero, the more they feel like they are in danger. If you don't want to do this, that's fine, but let me tell you a little story about the last time I tried to read a book where I actively wanted all three of the main characters to die. Nothing endeared me to any of them, none of their personalities were sympathetic, everyone was so smart and so perfect, and wasn't it such a shame that this bad thing was happening to them? And 30 pages in, I realized I wasn't getting this time back in my life, so it wasn't really worth reading, wasn't worth complaining about, wasn't worth stooping to a new low and telling people it was garbage, and here, here it is. It was this book. Don't read it. Anyway, Late Night gets me to immediately like its main and side characters. I like Gus because he's the kind-hearted butt-of-every-joke guy that comes across as a good friend to Jack. I like June because she wants to protect Lily and has similar reservations about the evening's performance as we do as audience members. I even like Carmichael Haig because even though he's a condescending snob and a small part of me wants him to get hurt, his snobbery is funny. What can I say? I like the abuse. Finally, with Jack, we care because, despite his sideburns, he's a modest guy with a big dream and a tragic backstory, which is the same thing I have in my dating bio. We're rooting for Jack because he's fought for his dream of becoming the number one late night host for years, and even after losing the love of his life, he's still fighting. Cue the creepy music. Now that you have your cast, and you've given me enough reason to care about them, let's put them all on stage and make me worry about who is going to die. With horror, you go into the experience anticipating danger. Your senses are already raised, and everything can be seen as a threat. It's sort of like when it's 2 in the morning and you set a new PR on Jaeger bombs, but now you're looking at the Taco Bell menu wondering how many Quesalupa Supremes you can afford while not turning into Christu. That said, setting up suspense with proper foreshadowing, reveals, and red herrings is a must if you want to squeeze the most that you can out of a scene. Looking at our original example where all five of our characters are seated upon the stage, the key detail I left out of the scene is the sacrificial dagger that sits between Jack and Lily. We cannot take our eyes off of it because we're waiting for something bad to happen. So, story time. One holiday, I brought a girl over to meet my family, and one of my uncles told a story about watching one squirrel bite off another squirrel's nuts. Ever since then, I get tense around that uncle in social situations because I'm waiting for him to give me updates on the neighborhood squirrels. The lesson here is not exactly Chekhov's gun, where a prop shown should be used by the third act. Instead, a prop should be used several times where it has some consequence before using it in a situation where there are big consequences. In Late Night with the Devil, we've seen the dagger used and mentioned several times, so when it is placed on the table between our hero and our biggest perceived threat, we know what can go wrong because we've been shown how it's been used in the past. Awesomely, which is now a word, the dagger eventually serves as a plot twist and red herring device, but that's not the focus of this episode, I just wanted to say it was cool. In your own writing, look for props like this that are dangerous or at least evoke a sense of curiosity. 
They could have just as easily placed something as out of place as a stuffed leprechaun on the table, and I would have been fascinated because it doesn't belong in the scene. These are things to consider when writing a scene from scratch. Which brings us to point number three. Every scene can and should have properly implemented build-up and release of tension, also known as promises and payoffs. So, does that mean we should have a dagger on every table in every scene? No. Does it mean we should constantly have our audience holding their breath? I mean, it might be funny to watch them pass out, but no. Should every scene ramp up the tension until our audience explodes? Not unless you want to clean up the mess. Like the pressure from a fart, the tension in a scene needs to go somewhere. If you hold it in for too long, it becomes extremely unpleasant, but if you just let them rip, everyone is going to know you did it. We want tension in a scene, yes, but we need small releases of tension as well, either within the scene itself or bookending the scenes. This is one of the hardest balancing acts with horror, which Late Night with the Devil pulls off exceedingly well. Starting from scratch at the scene level, I would look at the first part of the Night Owl show. The mood is light in the auditorium, even if it is tense in the movie theater. So, first things first, the writers subvert expectations. We are first shown Jack and Gus having some corny 70s TV banter. Chris Tu is the first guest, and he is played for laughs. He is clearly a fraud. The audience in the movie theater thinks, Oh, thank God. We're not just jumping into the deep end on this horror film. I still have time to eat my popcorn. But then... It's Minnie! Please, who will accept? Immediately, we are taken from a sense of calm to moderate concern. A couple questions are now at the forefront of our mind. Who is Minnie? Is Chris Tu a ticking time bomb? Like the dagger, our eyes are on him. We are promised that Christu is going to do something worth paying attention to, because he just did this creepy thing in the first scene. This causes us to wonder what he is going to do next, but then... We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be right back after these messages. The pressure is released because the line is so common, but is delivered in such a terrifyingly uncommon situation. It's like a fart at a funeral, and it alleviates a lot of the stressful emotions associated with the scene, while not undercutting the main sense of fear or suspense. Specifically, this pertains to horror, because if you don't allow your audience to breathe, they're going to feel exhausted by story's end. But you can see the same unrelenting suspense and intensity in movies like Public Enemy or Unbroken. If you keep your foot down on the accelerator for the whole story, something's gonna run out of gas, and it'll probably be your audience. Instead, we introduce a scene with low stress, implement some impending doom or ticking time bomb, and then subdue the impending doom. Notice that I said subdue. Do not remove the impending doom completely. Doom, fear, and anxiety make readers turn the page. We were promised something else was going to happen with Christu. If you remove the fear, that means you broke your promise, which means I hate you. Promises make viewers watch the next episode. One thing I learned from Scout Camp is that if you completely put out the campfire, no one sticks around to make sure nothing bad happens. So long as there is some threat, there is a reason to keep watching the story for the payoff. Which brings us to point number four. Roll over the high points of a suspenseful scene into the next scene in order to increase tension. Then use the state of released pressure to reorient your audience towards the next big surprise. It's a long one, I know. I hear that a lot. Anyway, like I said about the dagger and Christu, my eyes are on them for the entire scene because I know that they are equivalent to mom's extra spicy chili recipe and route to my colon. Both props, and yes, I'm calling Christu a prop, have the potential to make a real mess of the entire evening, and in both cases, we've seen both the dagger and Christu display some scary tendencies. Now, the key here is to keep these catastrophes front and center for your audience. If Christu were taken backstage, I would forget about him. If the dagger were placed over with the band, I would forget about it. But, since Christu can't stop coughing and that dagger is aimed to kill, I just stare at it and my imagination races. This is how you link suspenseful scenes into a story. Something that was mundane at the start of the scene, that's Christu, becomes something of interest by the end of that scene. When the second scene begins, my interest in this no longer mundane thing, still Christu, keeps me invested so that you can introduce the second mundane thing, which in this case would be Carmichael Haig. 
Once I'm a little interested in Hag, the writers can then ramp up the danger when Christu does his best llama impression, and everyone really starts to wonder about Jack's relationship to Minnie. This is the payoff for the previous scene. Since we as viewers know Christu is set to do something horrific, the writers reward us with not just something horrific, but a little more intrigue into what is really going on with this episode of Night Owls, Jack and his dead wife. This is absolutely genius, because as I said, if it's not right there in front of your audience, they will forget about it. I'm so busy worrying about Christu's eyes rolling back into his skull again that I forgot all about Minnie. This is genius because when Jack brings it up again, it's both a fresh slap in the face and a chilling realization that Minnie is not too happy with him about something, and I want to find out what that something is. This changes the focus of our suspense from what is going on to why is this happening? If Minnie is Jack's dead wife, didn't she love him? Why would she do this? And that slaps harder than Coa Viernes, because just like that, our suspense story becomes a mystery, and a mystery has the power and intrigue to keep an audience interested in an entire story if you keep feeding them breadcrumbs. This is where we establish a pattern of boring thing becomes scary thing, scary thing divulges a clue, clue leads to increased tension but is circumvented by a joke, and the joke leads to the unveiling of the next mundane thing. You will see this pattern repeated throughout the movie, each time in a unique way so as not to make the cycle go stale, and the result is a gradual rise and fall of suspense on our way to the story's eventual climax and reveal. I know, it's impressive. No need to applaud though, just throw money. This sawtooth method of storytelling allows for the build-up and release of suspense, the carrying over of foreshadowing and red herring items, the development of a mystery, and the culmination of all three at the story's climax in one extra-dramatic, super scary, toilet bowl painting terror fest that leaves an audience not exhausted, but exhilarated. So, if you're writing a story, horror or otherwise, look at ways to add suspense to your already written scenes which can carry over into future scenes of the story. When developing new scenes, make sure to remind your audience about the impending doom or threat hanging over them, whether or not the characters themselves know about it and build each mini-climax of a scene off the back of the previous mini-climax of the previous scenes. This will keep a viewer glued to the screen or turning the page, whether it's a horror story or a children's book. So grab your manuscript, look for ways to add more suspense, and go tell the best story possible. Ooh, spooky. The end.